The podcast you're about to listen to may contain random lines from musical theater, terrible attempts at original accents, and a sincere discussion about mental health. You have been warned. Are you ready to start singing with your feet? Formidable! Allez, c'est parti! Non, nous ne sommes pas fous, nous ne sommes pas ivres, nous sommes juste dans la joie. Une joie profonde, nos cœurs elle inonde. Cette joie, elle vient du ciel, non, nous ne sommes pas fous. Welcome to Sing With Your Feet, the podcast in which we examine our ideal life in the light of the golden rule and take tiny steps to start living it every day. The podcast in which we revel in the gorgeous Venn diagram that makes up our lives and start connecting the dots with silvery threads of virtue and value to reveal more of the intoxicating beauty of your Venn diagram. The podcast in which we can be honest about how amazing being a parent can be and how absolutely miserable it can make us feel when we're parenting from an empty tank. My name is Lily Fields, and I'm going to be your fairy godmother for the next half hour or so. Na, 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 Lily Fields. Oh, that's you. I, I like to imagine you like a southern belle, hoop skirt and all. You are absolutely adorable. Are you going to go on and on about the golden rule again? Because I think we've heard quite enough about that. Blah, blah, blah. You can't love others unless you love yourself. Oh, now good for you. You have been listening. Yes, indeed. I will be going on and on about the golden rule today. Today... We're going to be talking about parenting. And so, so much of parenting is about the golden rule. Doing for others what we would like done for us. Loving others as we love ourselves. And as you aptly reminded us, my dear, we can't love others like we love ourselves unless we first love ourselves. Now, don't stop listening to me just because you think you know what I'm going to say. Because, well... Your wicked stepsister Lyella is here, and she is going to bring her incredibly unique perspective as a death doula to the conversation too. She's going to address the question of how to support someone who has lost a child, and it has everything to do with the golden rule also. Fine, all right, but Lily Fields, the way you talk about Venn diagrams makes me roll my eyes. It's simply appalling that something so benign gets you so worked up. Oh, my little country bumpkin, did you mention the Venn diagrams again just for me? Why, thank you. Yes, I do get excited about Venn diagrams. You see, I truly believe that every aspect of our lives is connected back to a single original plan for our life. My philosopher husband calls it a blueprint. I like to take it a step further and imagine that each of us is given a treasure before our birth that we are to explore and invest in ways that are specific to the plan for our lives. The very meaning of life, as I see it, is to make the world a better place by investing the treasure we received according to that original blueprint. No, we don't know what the blueprint actually looks like. But if each aspect of our life, what I call the ideal life categories, is a circle in a Venn diagram, those circles will overlap in a very specific pattern for each of us. Those places of overlap are the ones where we can make the most impact. No single circle of our lives has more points of overlap, more potential to make this world a better place than the ideal life category of parenting. If we believe that we were given a treasure and that there is a plan and a purpose for our lives and we are doing the hard work of digging up our treasures and putting them to work for our lives, then it should be all the more important for us as parents to know and to believe that our children were given treasures, different treasures, different treasures to invest and that there is a plan and a purpose for their lives too. Our objective then should be to make sure that our children never dig a hole in their backyard to bury their treasure. And today, we're going to talk about how to make that high calling a reality. In the podcast, we're in the middle of a series about the ideal life categories. We have previously talked about scheduling and planning, work, our bodies, and our health. 
Next week, we'll be tackling literally my least favorite topic of all time, the topic of a clean house. Oh, this should be way fun. You'll get to hear me moan and groan and whine and complain, but it's also the area in which I have the farthest distance to go to get my ideal life. So you'll see just how real and how down to earth this heretofore rather philosophical enterprise can become. Next week, Practical Magic is the name of the game. But as I said, this week we're talking about parenting. I want to handle this topic with a lot of humility and without a lot of prescription. But I do think that we have some interesting things to share with you today. Now, the ideal life exercise is a habit of sitting down to think about just one of these themes each day for a few minutes and asking four questions about that theme. I have 19 total themes, one of which I esteem sufficiently important to living my ideal life that I consider it every week. The other themes are in a rotation that takes three weeks overall. My themes may not be your themes, and that is perfectly fine. After all, we're all different. What I want to do, though, is to get you thinking about the process. My themes are what rose to the surface after I spent some time answering the sentence that starts, in my ideal life, I am a person who. Here are a few of my, in my ideal life, I am a person who statements when it comes to parenting. In my ideal life, I am a person who takes her children seriously. I am a person who does not have unrealistic expectations of her children. I am a person who places more value on working hard than on succeeding. I am a person who sets an example for living a passionate life. I am a person who is not afraid of tough questions and difficult conversations. In my ideal life, I am a person who makes my children proud. In my ideal life, I am a person who loves my children according to their love languages. And I am a person who forgives herself when she fails to be perfect. The parenting category is one of three circles in my gorgeous Venn diagram that it's about relationships. One circle is my marriage, one is my parenting relationship to my children, and one circle is that for the relationships outside of the people who are in my immediate home. I decided not to lump my marriage and parenting into one big category called family because in the end, to me at least, they each deserved their own separate check-in. Parenting is where the rubber meets the road for many of us. For all the joy we imagined experiencing prior to becoming parents, and for the handful of moments of joy we do experience as parents, it's not always terribly fun. When I first was confronted with just how unsatisfying I found the reality of parenting, I happened upon a book entitled, quite aptly, All Joy and No Fun, by a woman named Jennifer Sr., Reading this book gave me the reassurance that my dissatisfaction with what had been, for a few years before my children were born, my one and only desire, namely, to become a parent. This dissatisfaction, I felt, was not an uncommon experience. Becoming a parent to a living, breathing, often crying, and rarely sleeping human being is one of those decisions you can't undo once you've made it. Once you realize you've got buyer's remorse, it's too late to return the merchandise to the store. If you are not yet a parent, do not let me discourage you. It is an absolutely worthwhile pursuit. It's also the hardest thing you will ever do in your life. Parenting puts a very fine point on just how we actually love ourselves. And remember, the golden rule tells us to love others as we love ourselves. It is in the fire of parenting that we discover aspects of ourselves that we despise. It's in the furnace of urgency that our patience with others and with ourselves burns up. One of the hardest things about parenting is learning to love ourselves so that we can, in turn, truly love our children. If we are truly to do unto others as we would want done for us, then it is not a long-distance logical leap to ask ourselves, how can I parent my children in the way I would want to be parented? This does not mean that we're necessarily calling into question how we were parented, although (laughs) I can think of a few times when I was little, I said to my mother, when I have a daughter, I will let her stay up until midnight on school nights. Lucky for me, I don't have a daughter. It means that given the current culture, the current societal pitfalls, the current technology, the current environment, that we must make wise choices for our children, choices that best reflect our values. (laughs) 
This isn't parenting as in training our children into the people we would have wanted to be so as to live vicariously through them. That's not the point. The point is to raise them the way, given similar circumstances, we would have wanted to be raised. Thinking about the legacy we received from our parents in both good ways and bad ways is a great place to start. For example, I was fortunate to be raised by my mother who loved her job. The example my mother set for me is one that says our work can be our passion too. That is a legacy I want to leave for my children. My father set the example of being someone incredibly resourceful and industrious and hardworking. So now think about that. What example would you want to leave for your children? In the early episodes of the podcast, I encouraged you to go back and try to remember highlights of your childhood. I believe that those moments of joy from our childhood are precious little strands that connect back to the talents and treasures we were given before we were born. They're like the raw materials that we need to fulfill our purpose on this planet. It was not an easy task to do for ourselves because quite often, through no fault of our own, those raw materials ended up discarded as unimportant or buried out of shame because they didn't let us blend in with a crowd. Or or maybe they got caught up in a confusing, unusable mess that was easier to just ignore and let oxidize than to contemplate and put to use. I don't know any parents who don't believe that their children are special, that don't believe that their children are unique or funny or talented or exceptional in some way. Oh, sure, they might be the same parents who find their children exhausting, annoying, and overwhelming, but it's built into a parent's heart to believe that our children are the cat's meow. As parents, we have the opportunity, and I would argue the duty, to help our children keep from letting those strands get jumbled up, sullied, tarnished, or buried. Having a vision for how we parent, not what we want our children to do, mind you, because in the end we have very little control over what they actually do, but having a vision for how we want to interact with our children and the kind of relationship we want to have with them as they grow It's the difference between having the image for a puzzle before our eyes as we start to try to fit it together, or not having it at all. Although I am intrepid in many ways, I am a puzzle purist. I, for one, prefer to have the image as a guide. When my husband and I wanted to become parents, we documented ourselves beyond reason. As we examined all kinds of parenting methods, education methods, methods for raising bilingual children, we came to agree on several aspects of how we wanted to parent. Number one, we wanted our children to grow into the blueprints for their lives with as few detours as possible. Number two, we wanted to live simply and with as few distractions as possible. Number three, we wanted our children to be as autonomous and as independent as possible, as young as was developmentally possible and according to their character and their capacities. And number four, We wanted to make virtue the guiding principle of how we raised our children. Neither of us were interested in living with strict rules or punishments or power struggles with them. Aristotle said that the pursuit of virtue is happiness. I really believe this is true, and I wanted to test it out by articulating virtue as the most significant way to encourage our children to live happy, fulfilling lives, in the hopes that our children would grow into virtuous, happy, and fulfilled people. Yes, My husband and I intellectualize everything, but we had been married for 16 years by the time our first living child was born, so we had the time to think these things through and to develop action plans. Of course, nothing works out exactly how you expect it to, but by having a plan, we were able to return to our documentation when things were seeming out of control. Maria Montessori and the Montessori Method, or Magda Gerber via Janet Lansbury for the Rye Method, Kim John Payne and the Simplicity Parenting Method. We had resources to go by and to return to. Oh, it's been a wild ride, but already today I get glimpses of who my boys are becoming, and those glimpses have made the less magical moments worthwhile. Just as we got out of the young child phase and into the regular old being a little boy phase, I was starting to feel out of control again. There was no handbook for this new phase where all the major basic developments were complete. Walking, talking in two languages, no less. Sharing, playing together, making friends, reading, and even writing now. Suddenly, there was the random question about sexuality. Suddenly, there were indelible character traits. How to keep an eye on their development when suddenly all the big boxes are being checked? 
That was when I came across a thought from one of my favorite thinkers, Bandra Bukowski. He often writes about self-esteem and creativity, and he wrote this. I mean, when I look around, it seems everything magical in the world was created when someone put their heart and soul into it. And isn't it true that one can only put their heart and soul into something that they truly love? Why not encourage that as early as we can? and celebrate the free thinkers, the oddballs, and not stifle them with trying to get them to be normal. It's something to chew on. I'll link to Bandrew Bukowski's work in the show notes, where you will find more thought-provoking ideas like that one to chew on. But the discovery of this little thought came at exactly the right time for me as a parent. As with any parent, I believe that my children are unique, talented, free thinkers. And if I truly value these traits, then I need to parent like I believe it. As small a shift in thinking as this might seem, it was revolutionary for me. Detaching ourselves from our expectations and the cultural norms and from what they should be doing and allowing them to pursue what they want to be doing in the way they want to do it is one way to prevent those silvery threads from getting jumbled up and to strengthen the self-confidence that will help them make better decisions. It's hard. It's time-consuming. It can be incredibly boring. But to see my children at their very young ages living with self-confidence and honoring what makes them special instead of trying to hide it in an effort to blend in, it gives me hope that they will spend the entirety of their lives making magic with all their hearts and souls. De chanter, danser, elle pousse à agir, donner, partager, et tout simplement de sourire, aimer. Having a plan. The virtues, studying parenting methods, it's great, but we will fall short of the plan. That's a given. It's like those amazing Pinterest cake fails that I spend far too much time laughing about. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about, but on the off chance that you don't, it's when people try to make something beautiful that they saw on Pinterest, like a gorgeous cake, and the homemade result is appalling or hysterically funny. When we fail as parents, which we will do, we often do it spectacularly. That said, Even when we fail spectacularly, I do not believe that this is a cause for regret. The bigger the fail, the greater the positive impact it can have on our will and our desire to make progress. Failing in a big way is an opportunity to reconnect with our core values and to recommit to our efforts. It can eventually be an opportunity to laugh with our children too, to not take ourselves too seriously. When we screw up as a parent, We need to be willing to laugh at ourselves like we would at a Pinterest cake fail. And if at first we don't succeed, try, 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 and try, and oh, 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 try, and try, and try again. It is never too late to sit down and consider how we want to parent. A word of warning, though. The later we start, the harder it will be to get everyone on board with change, including the children. The later we start, the more perseverance we need to be able to get through the uncomfortable beginning stages. It goes perhaps without saying, but it is never too early to consider how you want to be a parent either. However, if you're listening to this and you are not a parent, I would simply suggest that you stay humble and be teachable. Dreaming and having a vision is a wonderful thing. It's that puzzle box cover that I talked about. But reality can dampen that dreaminess rather quickly. Never let go of your idealism, but learn to be flexible. It's a tightrope act but one well worth mastering. Now, this is where the episode is going to get a little less lighthearted for a few minutes. If you're listening to this episode about parenting and you're currently struggling with infertility or if you've experienced miscarriage, well, first, I salute you for making it through to this point in the podcast. Your relationship with parenting has already begun and you are already learning that tightrope act. What is so heartbreaking for you is that you're in the uncomfortable position of having to remain idealists and learn to be flexible without yet having the baby in your arms as a reward. Your pain is invisible and urgent and it is constant. Your journey thus far is one part caterpillar in the cocoon and one part ski jump gone terribly wrong. 
It can feel so dark and immobilizing and simultaneously horribly out of control. The only thing I can offer you is my compassion. I have been where you are, and while I cannot know your exact pain or your exact circumstances, I know what the empty arms and empty womb felt like for me. Expressing your doubts and your hopes is not futile. One useful way to spend this season of emptiness is to invest in dreaming about the kind of parent you want to be and working on becoming the kind of person who can parent that way. Pursuing your ideal life in the area of parenting, as well as continuing to develop the other categories and themes of your life, will ensure that when your arms are busy caring for that baby, you will already be that much closer to living your ideal life. While you are waiting for the child to come and change your life, work on becoming the kind of person your child will be proud of. Lyella Kelly, your wicked stepsister, is here today to discuss a very sensitive topic. Lyella isn't actually wicked, I want you to keep in mind. She's actually a truly lovely person who I can't get enough of. It's just that her job is something very, very unique, one that many of us might consider unpleasant. That's why we call her wicked. She is a death doula. Her role is to help people navigate end-of-life issues, whether planning for advanced directives, organizing funerals, or sitting with grieving families and holding space for them. Her unique perspective today is going to address how to help parents who are faced with the loss of a child. It is one aspect of parenting that we all hope we never have to experience. What she has to offer us today will help us live out the golden rule if or when someone we love must grieve their child. Lyla, the floor is yours. Navigating grief, that's what we frequently call it, and it is an apt term. Navigation can be defined as travel over a stretch of terrain with great care or difficulty. Grief is very difficult terrain, and the grief that comes with the loss of a child can be downright treacherous. With this in mind, how can we support parents who are enduring loss of this magnitude? Let's start with a category that we'll call what not to say. Some of these may seem quite obvious, but our discomfort with death, especially the death of a child, may get the better of us. And before we know it, we have said something like, at least you can always have more children. Do I need to explain what is wrong with that sentence? You can't just replace a child. They are not light bulbs. They are individual, beautiful humans, and they are irreplaceable. Along the same lines would be a phrase like, at least you have other children. Please, no. You probably have a lot of friends. The number of friends you have doesn't matter when you lose one. They are irreplaceable. Again, humans are unique, and one cannot be substituted for another. If what you're going to say begins with, at least, it might be best not to say it at all. How about if you want to comfort these parents with a spiritual thought and you say something like, God needed another angel, or maybe they're in a better place now. I'm not going to have a conversation about religion, but I want to make note that the God that I personally believe in would not take a child to be with him instead of me. There is not a better place for my child than with me. That is my personal belief, and perhaps you don't share it. But this is my point. You may not know or understand the parent's feelings on God and death, and you risk causing offense. So keep that in mind. Avoid religious statements that point fingers. Such comments may not be well received. Perhaps you want to convey something about the magnitude of suffering that you see this family experiencing. So you say something like, you're so strong, I just couldn't do it. This is what one grieving father told me. That's a cop-out. He's right. People have managed this same horrifying scenario from the beginning of the human race. We could, in fact, do it. We just don't want to think about how much it would hurt to have to do it. Let's move on to things that we can do, positive ways that we can show our love and support. Just be there. You don't have to talk. 
Nothing you could possibly say will make this situation okay. It is not okay and nobody expects you to be able to fix it. Just listen. Put your own awkwardness and discomfort aside and pull up a chair. The middle of the night can be a really hard time. The distractions are gone and people are left alone with their thoughts. Can you be a hearing ear even at inconvenient times? If so, let your friends know that you are available day and night. Maybe you are more of a person of action. Okay then, offer practical assistance. Does the garden need to be weeded? Does the litter box need to be changed? Does someone need to do a grocery run? All of these things may be overwhelming in the midst of new grief, but you can handle them with minimal effort. Pitch in and get your hands a little bit dirty. Now this one is really important. Are there other children in the family? Parents will likely get a lot of attention, but what about the siblings? They have lost a playmate, a companion, maybe even their roommate. They may be so overcome with feelings of loneliness. Can you think of activities to include them in? Maybe something even as small as baking cookies together or watching a favorite movie with them. Keep in mind that these children might feel a little bit insecure about leaving home, so it might be best to think of activities that can be done in their own home. I have one last suggestion. It's both a what not to say and a what not to do. Nothing. Don't say nothing and don't do nothing. Don't pretend like nothing has happened. Something huge has happened and it will be a part of this family from this point forward. If you are going to be a part of this family, you have to do something and you have to say something. Even if it is the absolute worst foot in your mouth, awkward thing, your friends will forgive you because they know who you are. They know that it is coming from a place of love. They are just hurting. They know that maybe you're not always eloquent. Ultimately, all that matters is that you stood next to them. This is my plea to you. Support your friends, even if it makes you sad and uncomfortable. Just be there for your friends. They need you. Thank you, Layla. You just reminded me of how very important it is to be told these kinds of things. It's so critically important. But because it's uncomfortable, we don't ever want to have to learn them. So thanks for educating us. Layala will be hosting an event on April 30th, during which you can ask any death or dying or end-of-life related questions you might have. Check out the show notes for the details. Let's take a minute to review the four questions we ask for each of our ideal life categories. In the realm of parenting, what is working? What is going well in your parenting right now? Maybe you found a new way to connect with your children. My youngest, because he can now recognize numbers, recently learned how to play Uno, and I love to play Uno. So this is a new point of connection for us, and I feel like that's going really well. What about you? What's working? What isn't working? What feels like a recurring problem with your parenting that has got you stumbling? Go ahead and be honest. There might be more than one thing that's not working, and that's okay. Just state the facts. What do you need to think about? Perhaps those things that aren't working are related. Can you find a relationship between your children's grumpy behavior and their nighttime wake-ups? Did you hear about an activity that you could do with your child that might help you connect better? And then our last question, what one small thing can you do today to get you closer to your ideal life as a parent? Just one thing, something you can do. To love others as you love yourself means that you must love yourself. Growing and seeking to live your ideal life is an act of self-love. Being curious about yourself is an act of self-love. Answering these four questions is a way to be curious about yourself and pursue your ideal life. The act of answering these questions equips you to love others as you love yourself. You are an amazing parent. You are raising amazing children. You are doing a great job. Now go out there and make your kids proud. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. 
Don't forget to subscribe or follow the podcast on your podcast platform. That means you won't miss a single episode. And I really, really want to thank you for leaving your reviews and sharing the podcast with people who you think might need a fairy godmother. You are the best marketing department a fairy godmother could ever have. A great big thank you to Seven Productions here in Mulhouse, France for the use of the song La Joie as the intro and outro of the show. Also, a very big thank you to Matt Kugler who sang it and to Claude Egway who wrote it. This is your fairy godmother signing off. Just remember, it is never too late to start singing with your feet. <laughs>